Great, I think we're on. Hi everybody, I hope uh, we're just warming up for Rainer's Lane devotions. Yep, hi Rosie. Great, people are coming in. That's good. Hi Karen, morning, morning, afternoon almost. I thought I'd ask you while we're waiting, just in those couple of minutes, um, tell me what books you're reading and what you're enjoying reading. So I thought, Rosie, you'll be interested. I've started reading Francine Rivers. I'm playing posty between Megan and Rosie on that one and I've just started reading it. I'm also reading Tide Running, which is set in the Caribbean and um, it was one of Abby's second year English books, so it's quite challenging. I am also reading The Call, Os Guinness, um, that Brian lent me and is finding it absolutely brilliant. Finding and fulfilling the central purpose of your life. The fact that we are called of God and that's what makes our life meaningful. Um, so let me know of any good books that you're reading that uh, we all ought to know about. Morning, Dorothy, Hazel, uh, Celia and... Pete, Francisca, Anita, oh, you're all coming in. It's great stuff. Good morning. Oh, John Smuts is watching. That's good to know. Right, I see it's 12 o'clock, so I thought we'd get going. We're going to have a look at the book of James this morning, right at the end of your Bible, just after Hebrews, if you've got it. Um, morning, Nikki. Um, would be great to turn it to it with me. So we're going to think about being double-minded from the book of James. Morning, Andrea. So being Jesus' brother, I imagine that James was a carpenter by trade, uh, a real practical man, salt of the earth kind, you know, um, it doesn't mince his words, tells it like it is. And certainly that comes across in his letter. I, in reading it again, have been stung afresh by the harsh words that he reserves for those whose faith makes no practical impact on their life. It's a real ouch if you look at them carefully. Let me show you an image. Uh, let me see if I can get that, there we go. Now, unless you're good at mirror reading, I'll read it for you. It says, what matters most is how you see yourself. We've got the cute little kitten looking in the mirror and the majestic, powerful lion looking out of the mirror. So is the image we would like to have of ourselves the most important thing. Of course, that's what the world tells us, isn't it? But James says, if that's the case, we deceive ourselves. We become double-minded, therefore unwilling, even unable to put God's word into action. So James wants us to look in the mirror of God's word and it, allow it to define who we are. So to understand the urgency of living single-mindedly with our eyes fixed on that goal, the crown of life that Jesus has for us. And he says it's the double-minded person who gets tossed about, distracted from that goal. It's the double-minded person who looks in the mirror and sees only what they want to see, not God's truth. Now, the word double-minded, I think is pretty key here. So we're gonna have a little Greek lesson. So the Greek is, called, is dipsukos, that comes from two things. Dis means twice and psuche is mind. So it really is to be twice minded. Your mind is telling you two different things. We might more naturally say half-hearted or even compromised. So let's remember the context of the letter. Um, James sent it to the 12 tribes scattered through the nations and of course they were scattered because of persecution and facing pretty tough times. Let's read um, the beginning of the letter from verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking 
anything. James is encouraging his readers, us as well, to see trials as part of the journey to Christian maturity. Perhaps even the very thing that enables us to be single-minded. Now the first mention, explicit mention of this word, dipsukos, double-minded, comes when, Jesus, when James tells his readers to ask God for wisdom in the midst of trials. Let's read verses 5 to 8 of chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So taking our working definition of dipsukos, this person is, is asking only with half of themselves, with just one of their two minds, if you like. And James puts it plainly. Why bother asking for wisdom if you're not going to put it into action? Why bother looking in the mirror if you're not going to be informed by what you see? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, says James. Do what it says. I told you he's very forthright. Now, the second explicit reference to double-minded comes in chapter 4, verses 4 to 8, maybe 10. Let's read it. Chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people. I told you it was fairly harsh. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Half their heart is for God, half is for worldly interest. So the heart is compromised and the motives are mixed. So we come to us, what about us? I don't know about you, I don't want to be a double-minded or a half-hearted follower of Jesus. But I can so easily deceive myself. I can so easily cherry pick what suits me from God's word. Or I can find myself cozying up to the world, perhaps especially in difficult times. So what can we do about that tendency, assuming you have those similar struggles? During lockdown, uh, apart from a couple of weeks around her exams, Abby has had me on a daily gym routine. We pay our regular visits to Bailey's YouTube channel for our five minute workouts. Very millennial, I have to say. Now Bailey talks about mind muscle and this is where you focus your attention on the muscle block being worked. It's horrible, um, but it's amazing because somehow you are much more present to what the exercise is trying to achieve when you focus on that muscle block to the exclusion of all else. Now I'm not giving you a gym lesson here. We're talking um, about following Jesus. But so is the case that if when we pray, we're not fully focused on the God of heaven, we will be distracted, easily distracted, double-minded. We'll have our mind, half our mind is going to be on God and half is going to be on maybe what I'm making for lunch. Or maybe if you ever read a paragraph of the Bible and then realised that you didn't take in a single word, or oh, was that just me? Um, is that the way that we should treat God? So instead of mind muscle, perhaps we should employ spiritual muscle when we consciously put aside distraction as an act of worship. 
we focus on our God. We tell our spirit to praise. Using a psalm can be really helpful in that. And let's remember God's faithful covenant love and the privilege of belonging to the royal family as, as Abraham so powerfully reminded us last week. Instead of being half-hearted, let's choose to fill our thoughts with amazement at God's goodness. As Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 10, take captive every thought for Christ. Or in Philippians 3, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure and lovely and admirable, think about such things. Let's fill our minds with the praiseworthy nature of God. And let's ask God for more of his gift of faith. Simple. James bookends his letter with perseverance in suffering. So instead of doubt or double-mindedness, which turns the believer into this victim tossed about by the wave, like the waves on the sea, he encourages his readers to be patient like the farmer who waits for his land to yield its valuable crop. Be patient. Stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. And prayer is a powerful weapon of the patient. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, James tells us. It's the single-minded follower of Jesus who turns suffering into an opportunity to build faith through prayer. This is not easy, but it is precious above all things. May I finish with a, a, an example of exercising that spiritual muscle in the toughest of times and finding God's grace to keep on putting love into action. Um, we have friends who are medical missionaries and 20 years ago nearly they founded a Christian charity called Firm Foundations and this provides medical and ophthalmic care in the Delta area of Nigeria. Um, many people across the years have been healed, many people have been saved through their work. A couple of years ago, they, together with two others, were kidnapped. Um, one of the four was shot dead, and the other three were kept in horrendous conditions. David and Shirley Donovan have written a book on their experience, and um, one chapter that I found particularly moving was a chapter on grace. I'm just going to quote from it. During the time we were held captive, we were reminded that God's grace was available. It was not a theological attribute, not a disconnected experience, not airy-fairy for the few and not just words. When we tested and tried it, we found it was a reality, that in our weakness we received the strength of God. It was real, a visceral transformation. At home, in the comfort of our own life, we could perhaps persuade ourselves of some sort, some form of grace. Here, we took God at his word. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Hebrews 4. Here, we drew near regularly, usually when one of us reached our lowest point. In order to enter into the throne of grace, you have to actually believe there is a place to enter of the spiritual realm, which the man of flesh cannot enter. Even lying on mattresses suspended over mosquito infested, man infested mangrove swamps, you can, in the spirit, enter into the presence of God, the throne room of grace. It is by faith you enter, nothing more. But you also have to accept that biblically, you have a right to enter in. Entering not in your own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Desperate and totally empty we came. And we received his grace. Grace that was entirely sufficient for our needs. Well, that's single-minded, wholehearted reliance on God in our place of need. Can we pray for this? Let's pray with James' words. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, 
because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So Father, thank you that even our trials lead us to a single-minded following of Jesus. We thank you that your grace is freely available to us, any place, any time, anywhere. Thank you that you are our God and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to just see if I can scroll through um, any prayer requests. Otherwise, do please put in your prayer requests. I'm going to see if I can find them on a different uh, device. Um, do please put through any prayer requests. And if, if not, I'm happy to pray all the other things that are going on. Pre Pete. Oh, great, Barbara. You're reading Pete Gregg, How to Pray, great book, great book. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through. At the beginning, for anyone who, who uh, joined late, I asked what people are reading and what they're finding, um, finding really good. I'm finding this quite difficult. Please, please pray. Hazel says, please pray for a family who are grieving the loss of their dear mother, Sharon, Gary and Andrew. Okay, let's pray for them. Pray will throw off the sin that weighs us down, says Paul. Okay, let's come into a time of prayer and um, if you have more prayer requests, do please give them. Father, we want to lift to you especially um, Hazel's friends or the ones that she knows, the family who are grieving the loss of their mother, for Sharon, for Gary and Andrew. Lord, have mercy over them. Lord, be close to them. Thank you that you set, your word tells us you are close to the brokenhearted, to those who are crushed in spirit. Be close to them. Enter into their grief and suffering and bring them comfort. Bring them hope. And we pray that you will bring them eternal hope, the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, and as Paul asks, Help us to throw off that sin that makes us double-minded, that distracts us, that weighs us down. Help us to be single-minded and run that race with perseverance. So many images in the Bible of taking off the old, running with the new. We pray that we would be free from sin, that we might run that race. Father, we lift to you uh, the United States in these days of incredible turmoil following the killing of George Floyd. Firstly, Heavenly Father, we lift to you his family. We cannot begin to imagine the grief and the loss as they try to seek justice for his death. We pray that you would minister your grace to them as a family. And we pray, Father, for the whole of the United States, this fault line of racism that has been once more exposed. The mutual mistrust among different people groups and communities. Father, we see that only Jesus, only the spirit of the living God can make a difference here. So we pray that you would humble the people of America before your throne so that they may be lifted up. This has to be a work of your spirit. And Lord, in the midst of these protests, there's no social distancing whatsoever. We also pray for protection against a massive outbreak of COVID in the United States. And in this context, we do lift to you the developing nations of the world. COVID has been described as the biggest disaster amongst developing nations in our lifetime. It's bringing such economic devastation as well as the health crisis. And always, as always, it's the poor who suffer first. They don't have the luxury of social distancing. Father, thank you that you see every life. Every life is precious to you. Let us in the affluent West not forget and help us not to stand back 
from helping others, even when we're struggling ourselves. For our own nation, as lockdown begins to ease, um, perhaps despite some scientific misgivings, we ask protection, Lord God. We ask that you would hold this virus at bay. We pray especially for those who are gripped by fear. And we pray, we dare to pray, that this fear will drive them into the arms of a loving, forgiving, wonderful God who can be their Heavenly Father and who can give them hope and chase away fear. We pray for wisdom, perhaps especially for our government. May there be a genuine seeking the best for the country above any political agenda. Give them wisdom, we pray. And Father, as schools are due to be returning, primary schools at least, on Monday, we pray, Lord God, we pray for your uh, goodness and kindness in this situation. We pray for wisdom for parents making decisions whether to send their children. We pray perhaps especially for teachers. We think of Chrissy, we think of Elliot. I'm sure many others amongst us are going back into a classroom situation. We pray for them. We pray especially for Christians that they may know that they are cloaked in the righteousness of Jesus. Um, please protect them and keep them safe and give them wisdom in keeping the children safe. And Lord, finally, we, check, we pray for our church family. We pray, Lord, um, that none among us would fall through the cracks, that we would be a family who cares for our own, that we care for one another deeply from the heart. Let no one fall between the cracks. Let each one of us take responsibility for reaching out to others known to us, perhaps especially those who are shut in, those who are shielding, those who are lonely. And we do pray for those among our number who are struggling with non-COVID related uh, health issues, uh, for those struggling with cancer or um, kidney disease or um, different things. We pray for them, each one. We each know of others who have other health related diseases and also those who are um, out of contact with many people. We pray for them and we lift them to you. Thank you that you are their God. You are their Father. You remain close to them. So, Father, for this and all our prayers, we lift them to you in the confidence that we have been before the throne of grace and you give grace upon grace to your children. Thank you for your Father heart towards us. May each one of us remain in that love today. And may we remain in a single-minded way, knowing that you are good and that you are our Father and that you want good for us. So we commit our prayers and ourselves into your keeping for today. We love you, Jesus, and we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us today. God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye.